Lord has done for you and for me, how he's gone farther than we could have ever imagined for us. And not but a couple days later, we're guilty of falling into the same place that Israel did, that we begin to complain and we have a lack of faith towards the Lord after he's done mighty things in our life. Our little problems become huge in our eyes when they're nothing to him. Such simple trials landed at their door and instantly they were ready to forget about God who had provided so much, who had set them free. And he was now incapable of seeing them through in their eyes. You and I know that the reason why they fall into this place is because they took their eyes off the Lord and put it on their circumstances. And you and I have to be careful not to do that. That when things arise that seem like such a big deal to us that we would choose to put our eyes upon the Lord and not on our circumstances. We find Israel leaving this mountain of victory and they find themselves in the vulnerable zone and we looked at it and the the Bible doesn't beat around the bush for us. It calls it the wilderness of sin, the place where they would be prone to mess up between the high mountain of victory and the next trial that was to come their way. That is when you and I must keep our eyes upon the Lord. By the way, it's easy when we're in a trial to put our eyes on the Lord, but a lot of times we forget. But it's important that we keep our eyes upon the Lord in between so we don't forget about him and what he's done for us. And it's here where their faith is weak. We've seen them be stuck without food and water and they play the complain game and the blame game. They begin to complain about their circumstances and they begin to blame their problems upon Moses and Aaron. Anywhere they can pass the buck. Now I won't recap and pour salt into your wounds. (laughs) as deeply as I normally do, because last Sunday's message was difficult. Maybe not for you, but for me, it was a lot. You and I came to the conclusion that when we complain in the middle of our problems and our trials, we are not complaining against someone else. We are not complaining against something else. We are complaining against him. We complain against God who allowed those things to be in our life. So the first thing I'll do is ask you, how did you do this week? For those of you who were here last Sunday and heard the message, did you attempt to rein in the complaining? To let the Lord remind you in those moments? Oh boy, did he remind me all week. It was a battle. Because every time I wanted to complain, I mean, I think there was multiple times at work where people were like, what's wrong with Matt? And Aaron would have to come behind me and tell him, he's trying not to complain. He just gave a message on complaining. It was a tough thing. It was not a simple task because you and I are prone to complain, to blame our problems on something else. I pray that you had opportunity this week to put that into practice and let the Lord change your life. But if you were like, yes, pastor, I did it. I'm sorry, we're gonna have another problem. It'll go from one thing to the next. I wanna point out again that despite how terrible God's people were in our story, and this is what we'll see throughout the entire story of them, of Israel, God still cares about them and provides despite their complaining. Are you not uh, just in awe that God would literally give us things and provide for us when we're such whiny children? It's because of his grace and his mercy and you might not want to forget that. So God hears the Christian's complaints. When you and I complain, even with a bad heart, the Lord hears it. He's aware of it. Even when our complaints are aimed at him, and we're not sure it's aimed at him, but it is, he hears the complaints. Even though our intentions might be questionable about our complaints, he hears them, and he still provides what a merciful and gracious God that he is. 
And that brings us to verse 10, as you and I witness this miracle of bread from heaven, and I'm sure you'll be awed by what we find here. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for the the morning that you've given us, Lord, and the challenges that you have given us through your word, and I pray that this morning would be no different. Lord, we didn't come here to have it easy. We came here to hear your word and know what you want to do in our lives. So we ask that as we hear the word that you would soften our hearts. Lord, if we've come here this morning (laughs) and we're obstinate or we're stuck in our way, we're angry, whatever it might be, that you would change our hearts this morning, right now, so that as you speak to us, we might be ready to hear and be challenged. In Jesus' name, amen. So in our text, we find Aaron is now speaking to the people, and he's telling them to come near to the Lord, for he has heard their complaints. That's kind of scary, because they're complaining against God. They're told, you are complaining against him, and then Aaron says, come near to the Lord, he's heard your complaint. Now, as a child, do you know what that feels like? Oh, you do. When my dad would look at me and say, come here, I'd be like, great, I'll come to you. But when I was obnoxious, by the way, there's video footage on VHS of me doing it, so I know I can't lie about it. I would annoy him, and I would be obnoxious, and it it, it annoys me to watch it. And my dad would say, come here. It was a different kind of come here. And yet I'd get there, and every time my dad would show me compassion. I don't know why. (laughs) I'm not like him, by the way. That's not a character (laughs) that he passed down to me as much. But it's, it's an awesome thing to know that the Lord, even when we complain, wants us to draw near. And Aaron tells the people, draw near. Verse 10, now it came to pass... As Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Verse 11, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quail came up at the evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay around all the camp, and when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as the frost on the ground. First thing I want you to take note of again is that despite their grumbling and complaining, despite their attempt to look back and long for the world that they were enslaved to, God still goes far above and beyond to provide for them. Do they deserve it? Absolutely not. But yet God still provides for them. He gives them quail every night. And as we take a closer look, we'll see this miracle bread from heaven, which I think you'll be really surprised about the information you may have not known about it. But today, quail, by the way, in case you didn't know, because I'm a a bird person. Quail is a highly sought after meat. It's very expensive. It's not cheap. Go find it. It's hard to get. Raising quail is not a prosperous endeavor for it's an hors d'oeuvre to me. (laughs) It is not a full meal. And yet God here provides quail. And you say, well, why? Because it's the best of meat. It's a delicacy in many nations. If you look it up on your Google app or your phone, you'll find out that it's much more flavorful and it's more tender than chicken, which is true. It's more nutrient than chicken. It's just a high quality meat and it's realized today. And God takes and hands them the best. I said, you know, I put in my notes, I gotta say it, it's a joke, I'm sorry. And it has built-in portion control. (laughs) God takes and provides the best thing for them. It flies in and lands. It's fast food. It's, It's DoorDash from God. They have it handed to them every night. By the way, they were complaining. Oh, if we could go back to the land of Egypt where we had pots of meat. And God provides for them so much better after they're complaining. 
It's a weird thing because you and I would not expect God to do that. He doesn't provide for them some worn down old scraggly chicken meat, tough and dry, but he brings in live quail every night and it's not hard for them to get it. It's hand delivered to them. He provides an amazing food source. The very complaint that they had, he deals with it. And not only do they get meat every night, but God provides bread from heaven in the morning. And this was a miraculous thing. It's a very interesting thing. I'll ask the question first. Who here online thought God rained loaves of bread from heaven? Raise your hand. Why, why am I the only one? Yeah, you all are embarrassed to put your hand up. Some of you, it, it didn't, I, as a kid, <laughs> thought that loaves of bread rained from heaven. And that's not what occurred. The Bible goes into great detail about what occurred here. It was in the form of grain that it came, like a, a kind of grain, a heavenly. Again, we looked at last week, the description was a grain from heavenly corn in the scripture. The Bible has a lot to say about it. In fact, uh, it was a heavenly bread ingredient. This bread, which was grain from heaven, came with the dew each morning. It settled upon the ground with the dew, and when the dew disappeared, it was there for them to gather on the ground. It was small and round, and it was fine as the frost on the ground. It was very fine already, which, by the way, makes it easy to grind. It's almost like malto meal. Or, or we, uh, what's the other one? Malt milk, cream of wheat. It's very interesting because here's what it has to say. You had to sweep it off the ground. We know these things from the Bible and some from other sources, but I'll get to them in a second. You had to sweep it up off the ground. Numbers 11, chapter 7, says it was like the coliander seed or the size of a sesame seed. Like when you go to McDonald's and you have a, a hamburger with sesame seeds on it. It's the size of a sesame seed. And the color was like bedellium or like a pearl color. Interesting. Verse 31 ahead tells us that it was sweet like honey. It was pre-sweetened. Verse 23 indicates that it, sh it could be boiled or it could be baked. It was also could be used for porridge or a cream of wheat style food. Numbers 11, verse 8, tells us that they ground it on millstones or beat it in, in a mortar, cooked it in pans, and made cakes of it. By the way, this is my favorite part. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. We're talking donuts. <laughs> right? That is insanity. Now, whether this is true or not, and you'll have to take this with a grain of salt, no pun intended. Jewish legend says, or it tells us what this bread from heaven tasted like. Whether this is true or not, I just put it in here because just for your thought process, one only had to desire a certain dish and no sooner had he thought of it than the manna had the flavor of the dish desired. The same food had a different taste to everyone who partook of it according to his age. To the little children, it tasted like milk. To the strong youths, like bread. To the old men, like honey. To the sick, like barley steeped in oil and honey. But they also wrote that manna was bitter in the mouth of the Gentiles. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. That's just Jewish legend. It also says that they could sweep it up off the desert floor and not have dirt in it. It was passed down through generations to say that when God sent manna, he first sent a north wind to sweep the floor of the desert and then a rain to wash it clean, and then the manna descended on the ground with dew. Interesting. I don't know if those are true or not. It's just Jewish legend. But the information that the Bible does give us tells us that God didn't give them something simple. He didn't give them something less. He gave them something miraculous. Who in here likes cream of wheat? Who in here doesn't? Raise your hand. I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> but yet, I believe that those that didn't like it, I believe God made it something they cared for. But, 
as we'll see ahead, they were not content. Again, what was provided for them was miraculous. It was different than any earthly thing they could obtain, and it was hand-delivered to them, being given to them for daily sustenance. And God knew he didn't give them half. He, didn't, he gave them the best. They were being fed by night and by day, and you should take notice of that. The meat and the bread is representative of the word, and it's far different than anything else that you and I could take in. It's the best. It's what he's provided. And all too often, I find Christians trying to quote good sayings and motivational statements. I find many Christians reading books that are not really based on the word. They're on opinion. Maybe a good teacher's opinion. And they say to me many times, it's just a good read. It's an encouraging, motivational perspective. And that's why I like to read it. That's why I go to it. Some people watch a ton of YouTube to learn about God, and it's dangerous because it's not what God gave to you, you and me. He gave us the word of God, and it's right, and it's the best. Christians are guilty of filling themselves with other things, and God wants us to be satisfied by what, by what he provides, the word. That's where we go. When you're feeling down and you don't know what to do and you're not feeling motivated, get into the word. Go back to what he's provided and let it speak to you. Take note that they were to gather again in the evening and in the morning, and what a great example that would be for the Christian today, that you and I would, before we go to sleep, take in the meat of the word so we could ponder it. For those of you I saw up this morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, you should have been in your Bibles. When you wake up in the morning, you should take in the bread. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Revisit it. God was teaching his people early on some fundamentals that he wanted them to understand. He wanted them to gather and be fed before sleep and as they awoke, and he made it that way. As we'll see, a ton of the things that he does forward was to help them understand what he wanted them to do, to put them into the habit of doing something. And you say, well, pastor, I have a different schedule than everyone else. Well, so do I. It doesn't give you a time of day. It says when you go to sleep and when you awake, that was when we were supposed to be busy and do these things. That's the example given to Israel. As Christians, it is important that we are to feed spiritually before we go to bed and feed when we arise. It is God who feeds us with the bread from heaven. You see, as Christians, it's vital that we go to sleep filled with the word, and it is vital that we awake taking in the bread of life and remembering what Jesus done for to be healthy. You and I can't be lazy. Do you want me to embarrass you all? Who in here went to bed last night reading the word of God? Raise your hand. By the way, I'm not bragging about myself. I had to. What about this morning when you awoke? Who was reading the word before you came to church? How important is it that when you go to, who in here snacks at midnight? Or right before you go to bed? By the way, you'll find me in the kitchen all the time. I live in there. Ask my wife. I think she went on a cooking spree and made like 400 meals and it was gone in like five days because I don't play. <laughs> As Christians, we're so quick to feed ourselves and take care of ourselves, but spiritually, we don't find it important. And I love this about the story. In the morning, they see this ingredient for bread upon the ground, and it tells us in verse 15, so when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, and you got to comically see this, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. They called it manna. By the way, any video game person knows this term because they stole it. Manna, or the, the meaning of the word is, what is this? That's what they called it. But 
you might want to take note, they only called it manna. As God refers to it, and Moses refers to it, they call it the bread from heaven. The people call it manna. What is this? They give it its own title. Interesting. From the text, you get the sense of two different meanings or uses, and it's very well understood as you go on through Israel's story. They either use it in one sense or the other. Either, what a poor thing this is, is the description that is given. Despising it, which we see them do. It's almost like a sarcastic way of saying, what is this thing you have given us? Or on the other hand, you find them also saying, what a strange thing this is, and admiring it. And so as the teacher, I hear both of those. I see them in the text. I read the words, and I find out that those are the two inclinations of how it's being used. And I ask myself, how can you do both? Right? If, if I find a meal, when my wife cooks lemon orzo soup, I'm not like, what is this strange thing? I admire it. I love it. But here they find it sometimes repulsive, despising it, and other times they admire it. Does that sound familiar to you? Because you and I are the same. We often have both feelings towards the word of God. You say, well, pastor, how do you know that? Well, I know it above anybody. Sometimes I give a message and everyone comes up after Sunday and says, oh, pastor, what an amazing message. It just really lifted me up. And I'm like, cool. And inside I'm like, Lord, don't beat them down next week. And the next week comes and the Lord's like, give this message. And I'm like, they're going to despise it. And I give it and oh boy, do they despise it. When you teach it, you'll know. They'll let you know. I'm sure Moses understood when they were in both places. But we get up in the morning and we dive into the word and we're gathering as we begin to take it in. We read that complaining is not good. It's a sin. And then what we were looking forward to becomes something hard to take in. In fact, we despise it sometimes. So Lord, you're telling me not to complain. That's what you're saying to me. It's hard to take in sometimes. We despise it sometimes, but there's other times when we take it in and we're like, what is this? Admiring it because we can't fathom the depth of it, that it talks to our circumstance on a regular basis. Sometimes we get up and we realize that the answer that we find in the word is to our prayers. It gives us an answer. By the way, God answers prayers through the word all the time. I'll be praying, 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 and then I open the word and it answers my prayer. He speaks through it. And we find the encouragement and it builds us up and we're like, what a strange word this is. It's just so good. But then a week later, we're complaining about it again. We're just like they are. Might I stop here and encourage you because it's both. It's hard to intake the word sometimes, even for me. Especially for me. <laughs> I read it and it's either great or it's uncomfortable. Matthew Henry says it's a portion no matter what it is. It is that which our God has allotted for us and we'll take it and we'll be thankful. That is the attitude we should approach the word with. It's what he's decided to give us for the day. And it, whatever it is, whether it's despised or not, like Matthew Henry said, it's been allotted to us and we're going to take it in and we're going to be thankful for it. When you read the word, even if it cuts to the core of your problem and you're prone to come up to the pastor afterwards and say, did you know? Did you know what I was going through? It would be good for you to take in what was said and be thankful that God spoke to you because it's what you need. Feeding Israel through the bread from heaven was an example of God's way of cooperating with them. By the way, serving the Lord, following the Lord requires you to do something. Israel could not bring the manna. It wasn't possible for them for, to create it. And God would not gather it for them. Each one did their part. God provided, but the men had to take it in. The women had to take it in. When you and I read the word, it isn't God's job to provide it and gather it and place it for you. 
It is a requirement that you and I would go gather and take it in and do our part to accept it, to do something with it. We're also guilty in that area as we read the word or whatever we might be reading that points to the word. We, we read these things and we take what we want. No, oh, but I don't really want it today, so I'm going to leave it out. God will have to give it to me to make me do it. Have you ever said that to the Lord, by the way? Like, Lord, I'm going to pray for this, but you've got to make it happen. The Lord will only go so far, and he'll require you to do something with it. Because he wants us to take the word and do something with it, to be obedient to it. Oh, he'll help. He provides it almost all the way. But he wants us to gather it. You, as gatherers, should be gathering to take it in and do something with it. Which brings us to verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some, some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. That's a very interesting set of scripture. I also did not know that was there, that description of how they were to gather. First, I'll say that the size, the measurement of an omer is not really known to, to us today. Exactly. It's somewhere between a cup and a gallon. And it's almost a measurement that's not meant to really be understood necessarily. By the way, that would be understood better by you by if you cook. I'll walk in the kitchen. And I'll say to my wife, she's making a soup. And I'm like, hey, what are you putting in there? And she'll tell me. She'll be like, oh, it's, you know, some off the wall crazy thing that I've never heard of. And she's throwing it in the soup. And then I'll say, well, how much did you put in there? And she goes, oh, I don't know. Like, what do you mean you don't know? She's like, I don't know. I just know how much goes in there. It's how much it needs. And I'm like, I'm, that, that's, you know, my brain does not work that way. I'm like, it's got to be in a direction. I read TOs all day. It tells me what to do. Now, my wife knows exactly how much to put in there. And I, I insinuate that it doesn't give us the actual measurement. And it fits in with what's being said. Because each one went out and gathered to their need. Not more than they could handle, not less than they needed. They gathered what was right for them, what was good for them. They weren't trying to gather as much as they possibly could and stuff themselves. They got what they knew they needed, whether it was more than others or less. And I like that about the, the description here. Because it would have been wasteful and not beneficial for them to overgather or undergather. People often come to me and say, well, what should I do? What do, you, what do you say I read every night? And my answer always is, read what you know God is telling you to read. Read until you've gotten what you need to hear. You know, oftentimes Christians want to say, well, I'm getting back into the Lord. I'm going to, you know, whether they're Christians or not, I know. But people come to me and they're like, I'm, I'm going to get back into the word. So I started a plan. And I'm like, okay, that's good. That's better read than nothing. And they're like, I got this plan, but I have to read five to eight chapters a night. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, that's like going to hometown buffet and killing yourself. You're not ready for, for eight chapters. And you're like, how do you know? Because I study and it takes me weeks to get through one. But to each person, what they're able to, to gather and they need, the Bible is built for you. You say, Pastor, all I could do this morning was a verse in Proverbs. Good for you. Meditate on it. Keep it. And if that's what you need, then gather it and go with it. If you say, Pastor, I had to read the entire book of 1 Samuel to remind myself. Okay, then read the entire book, but take what God needs, has given and what you need and run with it. Not more, not less. You say, well, I'll waste my time. By the way, I think that's the other thing that is said most often, which is an awkward thing to say. I'm, if, if I don't read it, I'll never finish, and then I'll, that's it, I'll be in heaven. Well, you're, you'll be fine. When you get there, you'll be with the word himself. Chill, you know? Read the word at least and learn from it. Take it in and do it as it is needed. You know, by the way, I'll just be honest with my personal life. Sometimes I'm stuck on one verse for a week. 
and it's enough. Like, I can't go anywhere else. I'm letting the Lord work with me on one verse, and it's enough. But, oh boy, do I have to revisit it and read it over and over again. Do what you need to be a healthy Christian. Don't overdo it. Don't underdo it. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to overwhelm ourselves with the word and be gluttons about it. We are not to starve ourselves in the opposite direction either. We are to take in what we can handle, what we need as we need it. Pastor, I get my weekly spiritual mail though at church on Sunday morning and oh hallelujah, amen. It's a great thing to come here and I'm not putting it down. It's a great thing to come here and help Let me feed you. But it's a wrong thing to think that it is someone else's job to feed you. As Christians, it's a command from the word that we should be at church. It's a good thing. But David Guzik says the bread from heaven was to be gathered on an individual or a family basis. God did not command the creation of a tribal manna gathering and distribution center. Every household had to provide for itself, and a rich family could not hire a poor family to do their work for them. It's a cool thing to be able to eat out every week. Who here does that? Inflation has killed it for you, hasn't it? We're having to eat at home now. My food goes in my gas tank. (laughs) But it's a cool thing to be able to go out and eat every week, and that's what you do every Sunday morning. You go out and you eat. You're here and you get fed the word and it's handed to you and it's a cool thing. But as individuals and families, it's not realistic to eat out all the time. You and I have to go out and gather from the word ourselves, individually. Parents and grandparents, listen grandparents, you don't escape this. It's not just the parent's job. You are to gather up for your household. Let me challenge you, grandparents. When was the last time you sat down with your grandchildren and did a Bible study, or your children, and did a Bible study? Raise your hand if it was in the last year. Some of you can, and I knew you would raise your hands. Some of you haven't because you've not considered it. It's important. What if I told you I never did devotions as a pastor with my children? We never sat down and talked about the Word of God. Would I be doing my job to feed my family? You wouldn't respect me. It's a job that I have. It's a duty I have. It's something I do for myself, but it's something I do for my children as well. And when I become a grandparent, it will be something I do with my grandchildren as well. I'm supposed to gather for my household. So are you. We are to gather the word and to prepare it for those in our household because some of them are not ready to to prepare it for themselves. We can teach them to prepare for themselves as well. My parents and a lot of you in the room helped me do that. You helped teach me. You gathered the word for me. You helped me learn how to dissect the word. And now I am feeding tons of people because of your diligence. Why are you stopping now? I'm sorry, I'm stepping on toes this morning and I'm gonna be doing that a couple times. Now, how do you think Israel did here? (laughs) Just just as a little, uh, a little, questionnaire. We'll, we'll check in with Israel. How do you think they're doing? Do you think they do well here? I mean, this is a simple task. Food has been provided for them at the night. They don't got to go run around chasing birds. They land, they pick them up, they have them. They go out in the morning, they sweep up grain. They have everything right there. All they got to do is make bread. It's easy, right? How do you think they do? Yeah, y'all can shake your head no because they never do good. They always do terrible. But it's not terrible, terrible. It's like lightly terrible. They had everything laid out for them. They had clear direction, and all they had to do was gather, take it in. Let's find out how they did. Verse 19, and Moses said, (laughs) let no one leave any of it until the morning. He gives them a command. He says, do not leave any of it. Notwithstanding, that's an unusual place to put that word. By the way, that's not a good indicator when you hear notwithstanding. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until the morning, and it bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. They they had such a clear direction, and they chose not to do it. 
Some of them would gather and they're like, oh, I, I'll have time for this tomorrow. We'll save it for tomorrow. They pushed off what they needed to do today. They said, oh, tom-. by the way, who's done that when you read the word? That happens almost every day. It's like, oh, I'll read this and this, but this part, I can wait till tomorrow. I'll push it off. When you and I push it off, we're not being diligent to heed his voice, to hear him, to be obedient, to read the word, and it spoils. The word of God is timely. Like, it speaks to us when it needs to. Right at the moment, we need to hear it, but when we push it off, we waste what it's trying to do. We, we mess up with it, and that's what they do, and I love it. It says Moses was angry with them. <laughs> This is a typical leader. By the way, he gets this way a lot. He gets angry with them. And I understand it. I totally get Moses' standpoint. It's like, you know, you preach and you preach. It's like a parent. You tell your kids, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room. And then it never gets cleaned. And there comes a point where you're like, these kids are dumb. They do not understand. And it's such a simple command. And that's what Moses does. He hears that they don't heed him. And then they have rotten manna all over the place and worms in their food. Who loves to open cream of wheat and find worms in your, in your cream of wheat? I have a story for that, but I'll hold it for another time. They heard the direction, but they did not listen to him. A lot of them j- gathered and did what he said, but a lot of them did not. And they pushed it off till tomorrow. And Moses is not a happy camper. And I find it funny that God spoke to Moses. Let me back up a second. Why did God appear in a cloud, call the congregation together, and then tell Moses, tell the people when they're standing right there? By the way, if you look at it, he repeats himself. Moses already knew what God was saying. It was the second time he told Moses it. You follow? It indicates to us that they probably were hearing it as well. God was not saying it for Moses. He was saying it for the people to hear it. They heard directly from the Lord what they were to do, and they chose not to do it. They clearly heard God's command, and they clearly knew God's command, and yet for some reason they felt that they did not need to obey God's command. It was enough to hear it. And you and I cannot listen to the word and just hear it. It's not enough. We have to read it and do something with it. We have to be obedient to it. And we, we are terrible at it. As the modern day church, we're terrible at hearing the word and letting it be part of our lives. We, we get so distracted. And as a pastor, and if you're a leader, I'm speaking to you, and I will always do this through this study because I'm not just teaching people who are babes in Christ. I'm teaching leaders as well. If you're a pastor or a leader, it's hard sometimes to hear God's words and pass them along to the people. Some of you might not understand what that feels like, but it's hard to do. It's hard to stand up here and know that I'm going to pass a message to you that's going to hurt your feelings and it's going to make you feel bad. But I do it because God has commanded me to do it. And it's a hard thing to hand it out and watch the people disobey it or ignore it altogether or push it off. It's a hard thing for a leader to see. And Moses becomes angry with them because he sees the folly in what they're doing. They're given a great opportunity to just be obedient in a simple fashion, but they're not willing to do it. They just push it off. Moses is angry, or should I say he's mad at the smell (laughs) of the problem. So they gathered it every morning, every man to his need. But some of them didn't gather it. They gathered it to try and push it off. I'll take it in, but I'll do something with it later. As your pastor, I'm telling you, it is vitally important, and it's a part that you have to play to take what's told to you and do something with it. You've got to do something with it and not push it off till tomorrow because you are running out of time. That is a true statement. There are always those guys and gals who have to learn the hard way in the group. By the way, I am one of them. So I fit right in with you. The guys and the gals who think 
They hear something and they're going to push it to the limit to find out why they need to do it. Listen, if you've went a week without reading the Bible, you should know why you need to do it. Because life's not as easy when you're not reading the Bible. It gets difficult when we don't feed ourselves. We become weak and we begin to fail and we don't do the things that we want to do. Usually we're hard learners and we only learn from experience. And, you know, some of us learn that way. I was one of those people. I I would always push, my mom mom would say, don't do this. You'll hurt yourself. One time she said, Matt, do, do not. We had a hole dug, you know, old school. You would drive your car over it to change the oil. There's a, a pit that they dug in the ground. And my mom and dad were going somewhere, and they, they looked at me, and I remember it, clear as day. She said, Matthew? I said, yes. She's all focus. I'm like, yes. She's like, do not jump your bike over that hole. Do not do it. And I'm like, okay, I will not. She's like, Matt, I'm serious. No, I won't. She's like, you will seriously hurt yourself. Okay. Second she walks out the door, I'm like, let's get this bike and try it. And I wound up in the hospital with a nail cut through my head because it was sticking out the wall and I flipped into it, fell, flipped into the hole. And I learned that way. I never jumped a bike over a hole again. If that's you and you're the hard-headed learner, will join me in understanding it's better to be obedient than to try and find out the hard way. It's better to take what God gives you and say, you know what? That's probably a good choice. I'm going to choose that way. You'll spare yourself from a lot of damage and a lot of heartache. That's why Moses was angry. By the way, don't think Moses was this tyrant maniac who's like, you will just not listen to me. He saw that they wouldn't be obedient and he knew they're going to take a hard road and it's going to be harder for them. And it, it, it bugged him. And as a leader, that's what it should do to you when you watch people who are underneath you not take and do what they need to do with what they're given. It's a hard thing to do. I don't blame him. I get it. Verse 22, And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. <laughs> I'm sorry, the underlying humor in this book is amazing. They, get, they realize it makes him angry. They're like, oh, we didn't listen to him the first time, and he got kind of hot about it. So the second command was, on the sixth day, gather twice as much because on the seventh day, you're going to rest like I've told you. He's, God is setting into them a habit of honoring the Sabbath day. He's teaching them, gather twice as much because on that Sabbath day, it's my day and you need to keep it holy. Right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bash you all on this one as well when we get there, but let's just slow down and say, they, they hear his second command. Oh, and they go out, they rush out, they gather twice as much, these people. They're like, no, no, we're gathering it. And then they send the leaders of each congregation to Moses and they report in, we did it. We did what you said. Do not get angry, please. And I find that humorous because that's what happens as the leader as well. I'll give a sermon and everybody has to report to me the next week or in the week. Pastor, yes. I read this like you told me to. I'm like, good for you. That's good, right? I like it. I'm glad you did. But it indicates that you just feel guilty and you're doing it because you think I will harass you later about it. The ones who read it and don't tell me, they did it because they're obedient. They want to be obedient. They don't have to tell me. They're not worried about whether I find out they read it or not. And Moses is probably standing there like, oh, Okay, good for you. You did what you're supposed to. By the way, I say that to say this. Don't be surprised when I'm like, good. (laughs) Because it's what we're supposed to be doing. God only wanted them to be obedient daily. That's what he asked of them. I just want you to be obedient to what I give you. That's it. Just be super obedient. But he also, and you want to take note, wanted them to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. He wanted them to take one day a week and not work on that day and make it a day that they honored the Lord in it. They didn't do their own physical thing or the things that were to benefit themselves. They were to do something that honored him and not benefited themselves. 
And he set it apart for them to do it that way here in the beginning. By the way, from Genesis 1 all the way until the end of the book, God designed one day to be holy, to be a day of rest. Now, I'm going to bash myself by saying this, and I'm fine to do it. I've already been bashed enough this week, so we'll pass the bashing along to you. How are you doing at keeping one day of rest for the Lord and honoring it? And you say, well, that's not a requirement. That's Old Testament. No, no, it's still important that one day you're here, we honor the Lord. We don't, we're not doing something to please ourselves like we would the rest of the week to do what we have to do. We honor him one day a week. How are you doing on honoring him one day a week? I am horrible at it. I don't stop. I work and work and work and work and work. And it takes everything inside of me to be to prepare a day that I set aside for him. This one hit me a little hard, and I hope it hits you a little hard as well. <laughs> Let me plug this in real quick. It's super important that we take that one day a week and we rest. I don't care what kind of schedule you have. God created it that one day you should chill. And you should. Verse 23, then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to keep it until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, there will be none. It's a great example to you and I that we need to be in church. There needs to be a day where I do feed you. It's not something you go and gather. Put, put it on a break. Put it on hold. Take a day and rest and honor the Lord on one day a week. I had a friend who did worship with me. His name was Carmen. He's on he, I'm sure he watches it every once in a while. We used to do worship, and we were doing a worship like Bible study where we were understanding how the worship team should function. And I remember him telling me that it, he, didn't, he wasn't going to go to um, go out to eat after a church on Sunday. He was going to stop doing that with us. And I thought, what a silly thing to do. And I, I, sa- I think I distinctly said to him in foolish words, you're not supposed to work on that day anyways. And I love what he said. He said, yeah, but I don't want other people to not honor the Lord's day, and I'm contributing the, to that. It was like his own conviction. I, and I was, after I heard that, I felt like this big. I'm like, no, nah, you know, do what God told you to do. <laughs> but he wanted to honor the Lord's day and keep it holy, and it was a cool thing for him to do it. He understood that it was important that he took one day and, and just honored the Lord, and I I respected that about him. Even when we were in um, Europe together, when we were in Scotland, Ireland, he kept one day holy. Like he made it a thing to be obedient. And it spoke to me because of his obedience. He was willing to be obedient. But that's not where it stops. They're told to keep it holy. They're given this great description to keep the seventh day, the Sabbath, holy, and there wouldn't be anything to gather on that day. Verse 27, now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather and they found none. (laughs) That's probably me too. (laughs) And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? To Moses. Is that puzzling to you? It was to me. I'm like, what? And then he says, verse 29, see, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So I read this and I'm like, Lord, why would you put it this way? Explain that to me. Because the people are a bunch of boneheads and they're told to gather two times as much. But there's always that group of people that did not gather and thought, I'll just get it later. And then they go out there on the Sunday morning ready to gather some manna. Well, I got to get some of this manna bread and there ain't nothing on the ground. They have nothing. 
And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? What? Why are you blaming Moses? It's not his fault. Some of them did not listen and heed his warning and did not obey. Why does God cast it to Moses? We'll go back and answer that in a second. But you and I are to get done what we need to do during the week so that we can set aside one day to honor the Lord. I'm going to step on toes here and I'm sorry. In such a busy world, it is tempting to sacrifice that one day for some other reason. But God designed it from the beginning of time by example himself in creation that we should honor him and respect one day and give it to him and rest. But you don't understand, Pastor. I'll fall behind on all this other stuff. I will lose out by going to church. You don't understand what I'd be giving up. Matthew Henry said, appointing them to rest on the seventh day, he took care that they should not be losers by it, and none ever will be losers by serving God. You will not be a loser by being obedient to honor the Lord and be at church, to honor him. And you say, Pastor, I can't do it on a Sunday. I don't care what day you do it on, nor does he. You and I are to honor one day and keep it holy. But as your pastor, I'm telling you, Sunday is the day you should do it because it's the day that you can be with other people and fellowship, and it's important. Listen, if I can make time to be here, so can you. I guarantee you my schedule is probably busier than all of yours. You need to be at church. Whatever reason you have is not a good reason. It's just disobedience. You say, Pastor, why be so strong about it? Why be so pointed about it? Because some of the people of Israel ignored the command from the Lord that Moses gave them. They spent their Saturdays doing the norm, and when Sunday came, they found nothing. They were empty. They did not become obedient to the words that were passed them, and too many Christians are planning on skipping Sunday with the intentions, we'll just go another week, or we'll fill up somewhere else, we'll find food somewhere else. Those who desire to find must seek at the appointed time. Seek the Lord, it says, while he might be found. You and I are called to seek him on the times that he's called us to seek him. And this is an interesting thing that occurs here because God says to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Why did he say this to Moses? Because Moses was not disobedient to that command. It was people underneath him who were disobedient to that command. And no, he didn't disobey it. He w it was not his fault, but he was the ruler of a disobedient people, and God charged it upon him that he might f the more warmly charge it upon them and might take care that their disobedience should not be through any neglect or default of his own. Do you know what that means? Or is that too many words? Let me simplify it for you. When you're disobedient, God is going to hold it to my account. He's going to speak to me about it. And he's going to help me pass it along to you. Because I am up here to tell you the words that God gives me. And as he gives them to me, I'm to give them to you. But I'm not to give them to you lackadaisical or say, you know, this would be a good thing to do. If you feel like it. Gather twice, make sure your church on Sunday, but I understand. God's gonna hold that to my account because you and I should strive to be obedient to his words. And so I'm gonna hold you to an account because he's gonna hold me to an account. Moses was to give them the word and give it to them straight so that they knew it wasn't a if you'd like to. Too many times people come up to me as the pastor or message me online and tell me, yeah, I like what you had to say, but it, some of this is not relevant for me. And in the past, I've been like, well, do what God tells you to do. But as of recently, I do not let them do it, and I will not let you do it either. Because the word is not for just me, and it's not optional. When God gives commands, he expects us to take them seriously. And we're guilty of not taking them seriously. Again, 
As a leader, you have a higher calling. You have more responsibility, and you need to take the rep- responsibility seriously. You say, oh, whew, good thing you're up there, and I'm out here. Are you a parent or a grandparent? Raise your hand. Then you're a leader, and he's going to hold you accountable. Not by their actions. He's going to hold you accountable by what you did. Did you give them the right words? Did you give it to them straight? Did you hurt their feelings? Because if God wants to hurt your feelings and I'm a messenger, I'm going to hurt your feelings. If you're not in church, I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings. If you're sitting at home right now and you've made an excuse why you can't be at church, I'm here to hurt your feelings. Get up and come to church. Honor the Lord on that day. And if it's not possible, then honor him on on a day and set it aside and be obedient. If this speaks to you, note this. God would ask me why the people he gave me are not being obedient. Let it never be because I held back the truth as your pastor. Let it never be because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And let it never be because I ignored what I knew was damaging and did not remedy it disobedience even in a small matter is very provoking to the lord god is jealous for the honor of his sabbaths if walking out on the sabbath to seek for food was frowned on by god then walking out on sunday purely to find our own pleasure cannot be justified matthew henry said that and that's true i'll leave that where that lies Verse 31, and the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. It's making me hungry. (laughs) Then Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations as the Lord commanded Moses. So Aaron laid it up before the testimony. Very interesting. By the way, that would later be the Ark of the Covenant when it was built. And it was to be kept. And the Lord of Isra- or the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. And I, again, we cannot nail down that measurement. I'm not sure why. Um, most commentators cannot, we cannot place it as a certain measurement, even though it gives a great description. So they were commanded to take a pot and put one serving of manna into the pot and they were to lay it up before the testimony which would be the Ark of the Covenant for a purpose so that they would not forget what God had done, how he had provided for them. You say, well, how's that applicable to us today? I'm going to tell you. John Corson says it's important to write down what God does in your life. When he answers a prayer or he comes through on a promise or he speaks to you about something, write it down and keep it in a journal and revisit that journal from time to time when you're hitting another difficulty so you can remember what he's done for you in the past, how he's answered your prayers, how he's given you commands and things that you're supposed to remember. By the way, I was terrible at this, and I would have never been good at it. I am terrible at writing things down. And then God made me a pastor, and now I write more words than authors that I know. Everything God speaks to me is written down in very lengthy 20-page write-outs before me of things the Lord has spoken to my heart, and I revisit them often to remember what God has said to me. You should do the same. Keep Keep some of what God tells you written down as a remembrance. Because it was put there as a reminder to them. And not just them, I want you to take notice, it was for their generations. It was for those who had not seen the manna, who had not experienced it themselves, to be able to look at it and say, no, there's proof. God provided for my parents, for my grandparents. My dad did an amazing job at that. He was an awesome man, 
and he left behind a ton of stuff for me to know that God was faithful to him. And it matters to me. Your kids and your grandchildren are going to need to know that as well. They're going to need to know how God worked in your life. Leave them a journal. Writing down the things that the Lord did for you because then it will help them later understand that God cares about them in the same fashion and that he'll come through for them as well. Verse 30, therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then? Oh, I'm sorry. This is John chapter 6, verse 30. This is from a story that you know. But I'm going to read it to you and not tell you what story it is. You can go back and visit it later. But interesting. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then, speaking to Jesus, that we may see it and believe you? What work will will you do our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written he will give them bread from heaven to eat they challenged jesus with manna and say you provided with our fathers what are you going to do for us then jesus said to them most assuredly i say to you moses did not give you the bread from heaven but my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. By the way, it's hard to read Jesus' words and not not uh, hear the heart that he has. Because you and I are not to forget what Jesus has done for us. He is our bread. He is our manna that we're to take in every day. His life was broken for you so that you could be filled and have life. He gave it to you through himself because he loves you and he cares about you. This morning I waited to do communion until the end because I knew <laughs> that this would be the spot to do it. The Lord laid it on my heart that this would be the spot. So this morning we're going to do communion and remember the thing that was done for us. Not complain and whine and push off things that we need to do, but we're going to do what we need to do today and have communion so you guys can get your stuff out. Again, we're told that as we do communion, to do it with the right heart, to take in the bread the right way, to come with the right heart. And that means that we have an opportunity this morning, again, to take the things that might be in between us and Jesus, the things that maybe um, we've ignored him on, things that in our life we, we're not right with him on. And this morning's a great morning to take and lay that down before the Lord. Because he died for you. He died to take that sin that is between you upon himself. And this morning is a, an opportunity for us to get our hearts right and understand that that sin we do hand to him, that we don't hold on to it before we take the bread. We want to do it with the right heart. So I'm going to take a minute here and we're going to be silent. And I want you to go before the Lord and whatever it is that might be between you and him. Maybe it's some of the things we talked about in the message this morning. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're digging into the word and you know what it is. This morning is a, an a, a awesome opportunity to hand that over to him. So we'll be silent for a couple minutes and then we'll go ahead and we'll do communion.
1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're called to do until he comes. By the way, you should be looking for the day that he's coming. And, and be diligent to do this, that you and I would do it often and remember what he's done for us until he comes. We're proclaiming his death. And that's an amazing thing. It means that we understand what he's done for us. And we're proclaiming it. We're hanging on to it. We're making it our anthem that Jesus set us free. And that's what we do when we take communion. We're honoring him and what he's done. It says in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. What an important thing it is to remember what Jesus has done because aside from Jesus, you are not set free. You have not overcome your sin without Jesus and what he's done because his body was broken for you. And we honor that this morning. Lord, we honor the fact that you went to the cross and you were broken on our behalf. Lord, before the world was created from the foundation of the world, you died for us and you knew it. You were going to, to pay the price for us, knowing us at our worst. And yet you still went and you still did it because you love us beyond measure. It's unfathomable. And this morning, I want Myself, Lord, and the people to be reminded that the sin that you paid for, your body that was broken, covered it all. And it took the thing that is between us and it put it as far as the east is from the west. You've taken our sin and you remember it no more. And that is a promise, Lord, that we cannot fathom, but we are here this morning to honor you and to break bread in remembrance, Lord, of what you've done for us, that it might be on the forefront of our minds and on our hands in all that we do. So this morning we honor you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Lord, it was your blood that was spilled at the cross, Lord, that would cleanse us white as snow. Lord, I pray that you would, again, this week, help us to remember the things that you have done for us, Lord, that your blood was spilt so that we could be right before you, Lord, that we would come to you knowing that you see us as right and that we would want to continue to be molded into your image, Lord, that the sin and the flesh would pass away. And it's your blood that, gave us that freedom, Lord, to be white as snow. Lord, help those of us who are down on ourselves because of our sin. Lord, help us not to fall into that trap of the enemy, but instead that we would look to what you've done and walk uprightly. Lord, that you would give us the power and the strength through your blood to be able to walk the way that you have called us to walk. And it is by your blood, Lord, that we have this awesome hope this awesome reality that you've set us free. What a cool thing it is to know, Lord, that all that we have done to ruin it cannot ruin what your blood has done for us. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for enlightening our hearts, Lord, to your, your plans, Lord, your desires for our life. Lord, and they're challenging the things that we've read to this morning. Some of them are hard to hear. But I ask, Lord, that you would keep our minds and our hearts on your providence and your goodness, Lord, how you have helped us in the past and that you desire only good for us in the future, that you're going to continue to mold us and, and give us what we need, not what we want. Although 
I know you're the God who also does sometimes give us what we want because you're so loving and caring. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to focus on the commands that you have given us, Lord, the things that you've asked us to do. Help us to seek you before we go to sleep and, and arise with you on our minds that we would remember what you've done for us and that through that, the power of your blood and your body will continue to change our lives, Lord, that we would be made new, that you would help us to be obedient when it's difficult, Lord. Help us to continue to take the things that we hear, Lord, and put them in our hearts and that we would do something with them. Lord, you provide, we gather. Help us to be the gatherers and be obedient to that. We love you with all of our hearts and we thank you for all that you're doing in this church. I thank you for all the people that came this morning and I pray that our week would be blessed and that you would give us opportunity to serve you in Jesus' name, amen. And there we have it. It wasn't too bad. You better be in church next week. <laughs> Again, this week, go out there and I encourage you. Get into the Word. If you're not doing it and you know you're supposed to, put it into practice. Before you go to bed, open your Bible and say, Lord, speak to me and read. Don't take in more than you can handle. And when you get up in the morning, spend time pondering what Jesus has done for you. Spend some time with the Lord. Pray to Him. Worship Him. And see if that does not change your week. It's important to be obedient to the Lord when He gives us things to do. This week is a challenge. Last week was complaining. Hopefully you've stopped complaining, and this week is get into the Word and spend time with Jesus. You guys have a good week. I'll see you next week.